In today's video, I'm going to be testing out some different combinations of perfumery raw materials. And some of these are combinations I found in books, which I wanted to try out. And some of them are simply suggestions that uh, someone made me aware of. So in this video, I've got seven different combinations of raw materials and I've got them blended them up and I'm just going to go through them and let you know what they smell like. To begin with then, the most complex formula out of all of these with a whopping eight raw materials. This one is one I found on the Base Notes forum. There was a post a while back titled, Hey, this smells awesome so obviously I wanted to try it out myself and see if it actually smelled awesome. Now this formula I decided to try out simply because I actually had the raw materials whereas a lot of the formulas I found online I'm always missing one or two of the raw materials which sadly means there's not too much point in me making them. So I've gone and blended up this formula here. Now I've got the base note, which I put on a few days ago, and we're gonna smell that first because the base note is always much weaker. So if we go and smell the top note first, then I'm gonna become a little bit nose blind, which is gonna make it harder to smell the base note. So this base note, I think it's quite nicely blended for such a simple formula. Um, you can smell in here quite a lot of things. You can firstly smell ambroxan, I think, jumping out, but you've also got kind of woody notes and you've got almost coconut leaning notes from the, what I think is the coumarin as well. So if we go and look at the formula, you can actually see we've got a couple of musks in here, romandelide and galaxolide. And those aren't something that you necessarily notice, but I think they really help round it out. And then you've also got some isoe super, which is probably what's giving it that woodiness along with some of the cedarwood essential oil. And then you've also got your Amberofix, your Ambroxan, which um, is actually quite prominent. It's at 0.5% concentration uh, absolute, at least in this one that I've made up at around 10%. And you really do notice that quite strongly. And then you've got the Coumarin. And even though that's quite weak, at this low level, you still do notice it and it definitely gives you this kind of distinctive Coumarin note. And I think that's been dosed quite well because if you go too much on the Coumarin, then it can start to kind of, um, it can start to be a bit too much, I think. So I think this base note is balanced quite nicely. So then if we go and smell the top note, so we'll get a new scent strip and I'll dip it in. Now, when you smell the top note, after just having smelled the base note, this is a bit more juicy and a lot fresher. And what you've really got here is a sweet orange and ginger, which I think is quite nice in this formula. So as with sweet orange, you've got just quite a bog standard uh, top note, which makes things sparkle a little bit and it adds a bit of kind of impact to the perfume. And then with the ginger, that's a little bit more unusual, but it gives it a little bit of kind of a bit more of a zesty kind of kick to it. It gives it a little bit more of its own unique personality. And I think as a whole, the formula is pretty, pretty nicely balanced. And I do like this kind of smell. It's this kind of woody smell with kind of ambery tones. And I like the combination between cedarwood and sweet orange. I've always liked that combination and this formula makes use of that. So you've got this kind of sweet orange and cedarwood, and then you've got this kind of ginger as well, which adds a little twist to it. Now, when I smell this formula, I don't think this is amazing. You know, this isn't like a amazing completed perfume, um, but that's not to say the formula is bad. If I was gonna describe how I thought about this formula, I would say this to me is a really good kind of beginner's formula. And that's not to say that whoever made this formula is necessarily a beginner, but it's more that because it's so simple and it smells quite nicely blended together and balanced pretty well, and the kind of combinations chosen are pretty good. I think this is, if you're a beginner, um, and I know when I was a beginner, I had a lot of trouble kind of just making something that smells kind of like a perfume or smells all right. Um, so a formula like this is exactly what I would have wanted to learn from. Now, the reason I say it's just a beginner's formula is because I think it is a little bit generic, a little bit flat, and obviously it's only eight lines, so it hasn't got so much scope because it is quite a simple formula, which I think is a good thing. But I think to take it to a kind of completed perfume or something um, that I would go and maybe like sell as a perfume, I think it needs a bit more personality. It needs a bit 
it's kind of some more dimensions to it and it also needs I think a little bit more impact and lift so I don't know exactly what you'd add to do that but I think it would basically need kind of around this core shell that it's got um, extra layers um, extra elements and something to kind of make it pop a little bit more but overall I do think the formula is is good it's not like absolutely incredible but I do quite like the formula I think it's a nice little formula so next then I have a simple binary combination and this one comes from someone who commented quite recently on one of my rose series videos which I did last year and their comment was essentially well with your rose accord have you thought about adding beeswax and I used beeswax recently in the perfume that I actually released for my brand um, but I never thought about blending it with rose so that's what I just went and did here so I've got this rose and beeswax combination now, if I go and smell the one that I dipped in yesterday, um, well, firstly, I'm just going to say that this is an amazing combination. I absolutely love it. Um, and you can still smell it a day later, which is not the case for all of the combinations in this video because some of them are top notes only, so you can only smell them for a little while. Um, but even a day later, this rose and beeswax smells fairly similar to how it did just when I dipped the scent strip. And the way I'll describe it is this kind of honeyed rose scent. It's like we've taken a regular rose note and we've added these beautiful kind of warm, honeyed, golden notes to it. Um, we've kind of kept its character, but we've kind of, it's almost like we've added treacle or crystallized some kind of warm, ambery uh, sugar around the rose or something like that. And I think this combination is really, really nice. It's probably my favorite out of all the ones I'm gonna cover in this video, actually. Um, I just think these two things together, they smell amazing. So I definitely think it would be cool to try to design a perfume around this. So thank you very much for the idea. Um, I love it. Right then, so next I've got four different combinations from Jean-Claude Elena. Now, if you saw my video a few weeks back, you'll see that I did a review of his new book about uh, the botany and perfume of different plants. So in that book, in that video, I mentioned there are a couple of combinations that he uh, said basically that were good combinations or interesting or, or that he used in the past or something like that. So I'm gonna go, well, I have gone and blended up those combinations and now I'm gonna let you guys know what they actually smell like. So the first one here is one inspired by opium. So that famous fragrance opium by Yves Saint Laurent. I haven't actually smelled this perfume, but I know a lot of you who are into perfumes on this channel probably have gone and smelled it. It's one of this brand, Yves Saint Laurent, is one of their very famous perfumes. And it's this kind of um, ambery fragrance, it's kind of sweet, spicy, that kind of thing. So what I've gone and done is blended together the four uh, core ingredients or core raw materials. Jean-Claude Lena says these four are kind of the heart or very important in that perfume. So these are vanilla, uh, nutmeg, clove and cinnamon. So in this one, I've used a cinnamon base, which I have. I've used vanillin for vanilla. And then nutmeg and clove, I don't actually have a really nice oil for both of these, but I do have a more kind of economy or more budget oil. So the results of this maybe aren't gonna be exactly what they could be, but I think it's gonna give us a very idea of what this combination is like. Before I go and dip the scent strip, let's see what the base note smells like, which I dipped in yesterday. So this one, Immediately, it's very nice. It's this kind of warm, warm, fuzzy smell. And essentially, you get this like lovely warmth from the cinnamon. You get that extra kind of eugenolic notes from the clove. And then you get the sweetness from the vanilla. And the nutmeg, essentially what it does is it adds some kind of personality. It just makes it a little bit different from your standard kind of cinnamon vanilla smell. It adds something a little bit different. and. I think it's really, really nice. I can definitely see why if you made this combination, you would want to make a perfume out of it. If I then go and dip a fresh scent strip. So now we're going to be getting a little bit more of the top note effects. Well, it's pretty similar to be honest. Um, though in this point, at this point, the top note, you definitely get the nutmeg, I think a little bit more prominent because that is more of a top note. Um, also, the other elements to the clove, apart from just that kind of eugenolic kind of spice, which I think is probably the best part of clove essential oil. Um, if I was going to use clove in a perfume, I would consider just using eugenol on its own, the aroma chemical, for that kind of cleaner, warm, clove-like smell. 
But yeah, I actually think the top note isn't as good. It's more of a really nice bass note accord for this one, um, but it develops into that over time. Though partially you've got to remember because my oils for some of these things aren't top quality, so the nutmeg and the clove, you've probably got more kind of off notes or like terpenic uh, top notes that aren't quite so nice in those low quality essential oils. So if I went and made this up with some nicer essential oils from um, really good kind of perfumery manufacturers, there is a chance that the top note of this might smell a little bit better as well. But yeah, I do like the concept behind this perfume, having never smelled the perfume before. And I definitely think that it's something that's worth exploring. It'd be interesting maybe to come up with my own perfume around this kind of combination at some point. So next and we have another one mentioned by Jean-Claude Alena in his book, which is inspired by a, an actual perfume. So this one is a combination between frankincense and lavender, which are both pretty much top notes. And this one was apparently used in the perfume Encens et Lavande by Serge Luton's. Now again, I haven't smelled this perfume, but Jean-Claude essentially said that to him, frankincense reminds him of something a bit mineral, a bit cold. And he said that Serge Luton's noted the same thing in his perfume when he essentially said that that perfume is kind of like a sea of lavender beneath a cold blue sky. And you know how in the hills you get those kind of chapels. So imagine the kind of gray stones of a chapel and the cold blue sky, they're represented by the frankincense and then the swathes of lavender fields. So this combination, frankincense and lavender, what do I think it smells like? Well, I like it. I think it's a nice combination. And to me, what it really reminds me of is like a really, really nice, luxurious hand soap kind of smell. Maybe I've just smelled this combination in a hand soap before. And what's interesting is I do kind of understand what he means or what they mean about this kind of cold, stony effect from the frankincense. Uh, I can kind of imagine gray slate, that kind of thing. I can imagine kind of a very, um, a very nice architectural scene where you've got um, a kind of gray stone and it's, you've got a very nice kind of luxurious modern mansion, that kind of thing. And I can imagine you having this smell around. Um, but just in terms of the actual smell, I think it's a very good combination. These two things just really seem to naturally fit well together. And I think, I do wonder how you would use this in a perfume. It'd be interesting to go and smell that Serge Luton perfume because I think that both of these smells are quite prominent. They're quite, they're quite big. And I can't imagine exactly how you're gonna blend them uh, into what kind of structure of perfume, let's say, you would need to have to blend them in seamlessly uh, without them kind of sticking out and not working, especially because they're top notes. Um, remember, they're not going to last that long. So even though you've got this nice accord, you need uh, the rest of the perfume that's really going to flow in from this, that's not going to lose its character completely after these two are gone. And also you need something that's not going to clash with them. But the smell, these two things, um, it's very nice. And part, part of it could be because the actual oils that I've got for lavender frankincense are very good, high quality oils. Um, but I, yeah, I do really like the combination and I definitely, again, think it's something that would be cool to explore a bit further. So next, another one in his book, and this is the Accord for the Zan Candy. So I still haven't gone and smelled this, but apparently it's some old fashioned French candy. And he said his grandmother used to give it to him. He didn't like it at the time because it was bitter, but he said that actually that is the reason that he used myrrh in this formula because the myrrh symbolizes the bitter taste of the candy. So what it is, is myrrh, which is this kind of balsamic base note. It can be used as a fixative. It's very quiet. The actual smell is quite subtle. And then it's got mint and star anise. So these two are both conversely to the myrrh, quite loud. They're top notes. Um, they're quite kind of, they're heavy hitters. You kind of notice them straight away. And so, you know, you've got mint, which is that kind of strong minty smell, and then star anise um, is a strong spicy smell. So when you go and smell that, it is quite interesting because it does remind me actually of some kind of old fashioned sweets. It does remind me very slightly of some sweets that I used to have called Fox's Glacier Dark, which were kind of a licorice and anseed sweet, and maybe that's because of the anseed. And one thing that I did notice after this was that Jean-Claude actually used something called corn mint, 
which is a type of mint that I don't actually have for this formula. I used spearmint, which does smell different. So the spearmint does give you that kind of chewing gum vibe because a lot of chewing gums are made with either spearmint or peppermint. But nonetheless, I think it's probably close-ish to what the formula is meant to smell like. Anyway, the smell overall is very niche. It is kind of a herbal sweets kind of smell. And, you know, I can't see myself necessarily needing to use it too much or even at all, but it's it's nice to have experienced it, to know this combination, and you never know, maybe there's some use that I could have for it. And the other thing is I would actually quite like to try it with corn mint instead of the spearmint, just because, you know, that's obviously going to change it a little bit, and it's obviously not quite as intended like this. So while we're still looking at Jean-Claude's book, there was one more combination that I wanted to try out, and that specifically was his one for tomato leaf. He said in that book, while working on a perfume for the brand Sisley called Eau de Campagne, he, um, as part of it, had to illustrate or suggest a tomato leaf as part of the notes of that perfume. And he said the way he did that was by creating an illusion from the combination of mandarin and galbanum. So, that's what I've gone and blended together here. I've got mandarin and galbanum essential oil. Now, do note that my galbanum isn't the best quality. It's a really old oil that's a bit out of date. I should probably get a new one by a better manufacturer. So that could throw things off a little bit. And again, these are both top notes, so it is really a top note accord. So this one, this one is interesting. What I will say is the first thing I noticed was that I was kind of disappointed because it doesn't really smell particularly like tomato leaves. If you know that smell, it's very distinctive. It's got this unique kind of herbal um, note to it and that is not included in this. So I wouldn't say it actually smells like tomato leaves. But that said, what I did find quite interesting was despite the fact that it doesn't smell like tomato leaves, it kind of conjures up a very similar feeling in my head. It gives me that same kind of spring-summer um, greenhouse kind of happy feeling that you get when you're smelling the tomato leaves. And I guess part of this must be just because that kind of, you get that fresh, bright, uh, happy citrus from the mandarin, which is a bit more unusual than the normal, say, sweet orange, I think mandarin is a little bit more, it's got these kind of uh, complex, uh, slightly herbal, bit kind of fuzzy notes to it. And then you've got the garbanum, which is this kind of bright green note. So I guess together they give this kind of spring greenery note. So it doesn't actually smell like tomato leaves. But one thing I found interesting was if I then take the tomato leaf natural, which is a raw material by Robert Tay, which is meant to uh, also mimic the smell of tomato leaves, well, if I go and dip that on a scent strip, when you smell this, it's quite uh, green. It's quite, it's got quite grassy green, and it's almost got some slight kind of sulfurous notes, and I assume some notes which are important in tomato. It does, this does remind me of tomato leaf more than that combination for sure. But I found if you take the two together, this was a really nice accord. I can't quite tell if it smells more or less like a tomato leaf than the Robertet one alone. But having that note from the Mandarin, and I assume from the Galbanum as well, together with this version of the tomato leaf, this smells really, really nice, and it definitely does remind you of tomato leaves. So I think this, it makes me really happy. This Just smelling this is like a warm spring summer's day, and you've got loads of fresh, kind of um, greenery and kind of tomato leaves, that kind of thing in the garden. And you know when it's just really sunny and you're really happy? It reminds me of that. So this combination I think is pretty cool. Take uh, mandarin, a bit of galbanum, just a touch because it's really strong, and then the tomato leaf natural. And I just really like this. This could be the basis for a really fresh uh, spring green kind of perfume. So I think this is an interesting idea definitely to explore again sometime in the future. Maybe try making a little perfume around this. Cool. So, in that case, we've got one combination left. And this one is actually from a different book. This is from Scent and Chemistry. That's that book that I talked about in 
my video a few months back when I reviewed my top three books for perfumery. This was one of those books. This one focuses quite a lot on chemistry and it's one I said is maybe not for everyone. Um, but one little combination that I pulled out of that book was a musk one. And this was specifically if you wanted to make apparently a white musk accord, so that kind of laundry smell, it said you should combine herbanolide and helvetolide. Now, herbanolide to me is quite strong and I do quite like this musk. It smells to me like, imagine you've done the ironing, that really kind of hot iron um, laundry smell, that kind of thing. It smells a little bit metallic, um, a little bit fuzzy. It smells quite nice. Now, Helvetolide, on the other hand, I have trouble with, and that's because this one to me is extremely subtle. It's quite hard to smell. And according to the book, it's more on the kind of lighter, a bit more fruity side of musks. It's got apparently a, a fresher kind of pear nuance to it. So what I did was I took the habanolide on its own because I know that I can smell that. And then I took habanolide and mixed it with helvetolide and I made sure it was mostly helvetolide to make sure I'd really get as strong as possible note from the helvetolide. And I just wanted to compare the two and see what would happen. So when you've got the habanolide, again, you've got that. It's, I think it's quite a low tone. It's quite a kind of thick, um, but it's a nice warm, fuzzy, it's like a duvet kind of thickness. Um, this musk and it's kind of hot and powdery as well. Then the one with the helvetolide added in, I think that it does um, have this very subtle effect, but I do think it has an effect. And I think the effect is to lift it up. It's to make it a little bit brighter. It kind of increases the volume, makes it a bit more, let's say airy. And it adds this kind of just slight freshness to it. It's almost the effect of adding hedione maybe to something. You could say it's quite a transparent effect, but it kind of opens it up a little bit. And I do think this combination, I can see why you would call it a white musk or a laundry musk. I do still feel like even having more helvetolide, I can still mostly smell the habanolide but I can kind of notice this change that's happened. It's just, it's less kind of thick and heavy. It just feels a bit, it feels lighter. It just feels a bit more kind of soft. So yeah, I'll probably have to do a lot more smelling of this just because I find the helvetolide quite difficult to really understand fully what's going on here. Um, but I think the combination is quite promising and I think this could be a nice musk base to start building a perfume around just as a kind of simple, kind of fresh, well, white musk base. So yeah, I think this cord is quite nice too. I would recommend you trying it, especially if you're into musks and that kind of thing. Well, that's it. Seven different combinations using perfumery raw materials, different little binary combinations, accords, blends, and that kind of thing. Now, I hope you found something interesting in this video. Uh, do let me know if you want to actually try out any of these combinations for yourself. Tell me if you liked it, if you thought the same as me, or actually if you thought something different, or even if you just thought it was trash, then do let me know down in the comments. I'll be very interested to find out your thoughts on these because I did only go and make them the other day, so I haven't had that much of a chance yet to really get to know them better. And if you did like this video, do consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel because that way you'll get all the new videos that I make just like this into your inbox, into your subscription feed on YouTube, and that way you'll see them as soon as they come out. So thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time with another video all about perfumery. This video is sponsored by Luxeterra, my online store where you can find all of the essential equipment for perfumery. Only good quality and good value for money products make the cut, and I use almost all of the products myself when making perfumes for my brand. To browse the full range of products, visit www.lux-terra.co.uk or click the link in the description.